Mel side. Um, well, this week I read about someone who I'm going to go out on a limb here and say you know about her, that you've heard of her, um, and that is Rosa Parks. And um, well, you may have heard or you know what she did um, and how she's seen as the mother of the civil rights movement, um, but you may not know how much of a role her faith played in that and um, kind of all the background leading up to that. So that's what I'm going to touch on today. So she was born, Rosa Parks was born in Tuskegee, Alabama in 1913. And growing up um, her entire life, she was a part of the American Methodist Episcopal Church. She said that daily devotions played an important role in her childhood. Um, she lived with her mother and maternal grandparents, and her grandmother would read the Bible every day, and her grandfather would pray with them. And she said um, of the Bible that its teaching became a way of life and helped me in dealing with my day-to-day -day problems. Um, she saw in the Bible... Um, teachings that people should stand up for rights, uh, like Israel with Pharaoh. And um, so, yes, she lived um, with them, and her grandpa had been born during slavery times, and um, so um, he taught her to always be ready to protect herself against hostile whites if um, something should occur. And the Ku Klux Klan became active um, in her area around 1919, when she was about six. And um, so things like wearing clothes to bed so they could be ready to run in case they were attacked or sleeping, um, her grandpa would sleep with a shotgun nearby. Um, luckily, they were never um, attacked or anything in their home. But um, as she would walk to school, she was also faced um, with being insulted by white children or rocks thrown at her on her way to school. And she said um, as a child, she would recite specific Bible verses to herself um, so that she could face that. Psalm 23 and 27 um, were her favorite, which they open. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Um, so she accredited her faith um, not only in the early years, but also later on in the big, um, she wouldn't, you know, move them on the bus moment, um, to, she accredited her faith being the reason that she was able to face that without fear, um, because, you know, it says the Lord does not give us a spirit of fear. Um, she also attended a later, a, a school for girls in which all the white teachers, all white teachers taught all black students, and, um, at that school, and there was Bible reading and prayer every day, and that school was also burned down by hostile whites. So um, this is just the background of her childhood facing all this um, racism and discrimination. And in 1931, she met Raymond Parks, who would become her husband, and he was a charter member of the Montgomery NAACP. And so their relationship is really what brought her into paying attention to the civil rights issues and got her into that movement. So um, at first she wasn't allowed in the groups. It was very dangerous. Members had been murdered. Um, but she was... Um, but she started to get into that, eventually became the secretary, and um, and was charged with keeping track of discrimination and violence attacks against blacks. Um, so she was very aware of what was going on. And also, um, you know, she it's not like this bus incident was the first time she stood up. She had a, um, she always um, really stood up for what she believed in, in, but not so overt ways, but she was rightly offended by the Jim Crow regulations of separated drinking fountains, restrooms, elevators. So she had just avoided them at all costs to preserve her dignity. She would not use them. Rather than take, um, taking the ele color to elevator, right, she would just take the stairs. Um, she would wait until she got home to use the restroom so that she didn't have to use the colored restroom. And, um, and so she, um, always stood up for that. And, um, and then in, there was actually a, a streetcar boycott before she was born in 1900, between 1900 and 1910. Um, and it resulted in the South, in the integration of streetcars, but it didn't last. And so in the 1940s, um, the buses were segregated and bus drivers carried guns even, and they had police power to separate, to rearrange seating. And, um... So the, the group that she was, the NAACP she was part of, they knew that more black citizens rode the city buses than whites did, and they thought about a boycott, um, but they knew that it would have to be widely adopted in order to make a difference. And so they thought about leveraging the case of someone off, um, forced off the buses, but they knew that they would need a perfect plaintiff. Um, and someone that, you know, uh, they said a woman, because she'd be more sympathetic, of high moral character so that nobody, no one could attack, you know, the person that they were rallying around. And they thought they had someone, um, Claudette, 
Colvin, I, I don't know exactly how you pronounce it, but she, but, and she was a 15 year old, um, removed from the bus, but then they found out she was pregnant out of wedlock, and they thought people would attack her character for that, so they couldn't use that. And, um, and what you may not know, again, her, she always, Rosa always stood up for what she believed and didn't give into these things. And so actually before the incident in 1955, in 1943, she actually boarded a packed bus that was, you couldn't, blacks, so they were supposed to enter from the back door, but it was packed and she couldn't get through because there were people standing in the doorway. So she actually went, boarded on the front and walked through some people to the back. And the driver, James F. Blake, told her to get off and get back on from the back. And she refused, and she said, I'm already on the bus, why would I get off and get back on? And he forced her off the bus, and um, she decided that she was never going to ride his bus again. And so, that brings us to December 1st, 1955. She was distracted by Christmas shopping that she had done after work. She was thinking about dinner, about the NAACP Youth Council meeting that night. She didn't look to see whose bus she was getting on, and she happened, she was already on the bus, um, when she saw James F. Blake staring at her. And she found a seat in the row um, behind the sign that read colored, and it was already filled with three others. And um, after a couple of stops, the seats in the white only section uh, filled up and one white man was left standing. And by law, no black person could sit in the same row as a white person. So Blake ordered all four people in Rose's row to move for the one white man to sit down. After a second order, the three people moved, three others moved, but Rosa simply slid over to the window. People said that she didn't move because she was tired, but she said she wasn't physically tired, at least not more than any other day of work. She said, no, the only tired I was was tired of giving in. And when, Black, or when Blake, the um, driver, said that he'd have her arrested, she responded, she calmly responded, you may do that. While waiting for the police, she wasn't thinking about becoming the NAACP te test case for the boycott. Um, that really wasn't on her mind. It was just the perfect um, collection of events that set this up. Uh, and she she was worried more about more worried about what she would, might face upon the police's arrival. When the officers asked her why she didn't stand up, she asked back, um, "Why do you push us? Why do you all push us around?" And this response, I think, is very telling. He said, "The police officer said." I don't know, but the law is the law, and you're under arrest. That is so unfortunate. Um, they just pushed him around for no reason, and he acknowledged it, but he still enforced these um, unfair, unjust laws. And uh, at City Hall, she wasn't given a cup of water or allowed to make a phone call. Once she got to the jail, she was finally able to call home. And her husband contacted um, white friends who could help post bail, and she was given a trial date four days later. And it wasn't until later that evening at home that they all suddenly realized that this was it, that Rosa was the perfect person for their boycott. And so um, they spread the word as quickly as they could with pamphlets in a newspaper from the pulpits in black churches, but they didn't know, would it be enough? Uh, and on the day of the trial, the buses were nearly empty all day. And blacks took cabs, they walked, they carpooled, they even rode mules and buggies. And... Um, and then at the trial, her attorneys entered not guilty plea, but they didn't intend to defend her against the charges. The point was to appeal to a higher court and to have the segregation laws themselves deemed un unconstitutional and changed. So she was found guilty of not moving on the bus. And the same night, a group of ministers formed the Montgomery, Im Montgomery Improvement Association, and they elected Martin Luther King Jr. as the first president. And they unanimously decided, along with hundreds of supporters standing outside the church there they were meeting, to continue the bus boycott until changes were made. So the boycott ended up continuing for 381 days. No blacks took the buses ever, not in the rain, not when they were harassed by police or others. They never took the buses. And it gathered national attention and support. People sent items to help those who were fired from their jobs for supporting the boycott or who were wearing through their shoes because they were walking so far to work each day. Um, black cab drivers agreed to drive people at the lower bus fare rates until the police arrested them for it. Not sure how that works. They could charge whatever rates they want. Um, to which volunteer drivers began driving, um, operating with church-owned station wagons. And... Um, you know, people were angry. King, both Kings and Nixons, who's the president of the um, NAACP chapter, both of their homes were bombed. Um, some attorneys found an old law that actually made boycotts illegal, and King was put on trial and found guilty. Um, and the conviction was eventually overturned after appeal, but 
Um, meanwhile, a federal district court ruled in favor of the black citizens in a similar case, and the city appealed to the Supreme Court. So a final decision was coming. So on November 13th, 1956, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that it was unconstitutional to segregate riders on city buses. Praise the Lord. Right? The, the written order came to the city on December 20th, and the blacks started riding the buses again in Montgomery. And there was still a rocky transition, shots being fired at buses and through King's front door. The city increased segregation in other areas of life. Rosa had so many death threats that her and her husband moved to Detroit. Uh, but nevertheless, the movement had begun. And she continued to speak and take part in marches and demonstrations. And she greatly believed uh, it, that large, nonviolent demonstrations and boycotts worked. However, she also held that in some situations, for self-defense, um, violence might be necessary. Um, you know, that raising of always being ready to run and sleeping with a shotgun nearby. Um, but after she lost, and then after she lost many of her family members, she founded um, Rosa and Raymond Parks Institute for Self-Development and the Rosa L. Parks Scholarship Foundation to aspire African-American youth to pursue education. So she always continued on in her work. Um, and in her, one of her books called Quiet Strength, she uh, talked about uh, the prominence of her faith in all that she had been through. And she wrote um, that, um, as a child, I learned from the Bible to trust in God and not be afraid. And I felt the Lord would give me the strength to endure whatever I had to face. God did away with all my fear. And um, so I just reminded of that Second Timothy 1, 7, you know, for God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and of self-control. And... Um, <sighs> It, how it just launched her into um, being, and she didn't set out to be the mother of the civil rights movement, right? She just was doing what was right. She was just doing good. And um, it also made me think of her, the idea of her needing to be the perfect plaintiff, right? It had to be someone of high moral character. It reminded me of um, First Peter, and uh, he talks a lot in this, um, in First Peter about being submissive to authority, but he also talks about suffering and doing good, not suffering for doing evil, but for doing good. And so in 1 Peter 2, um, 13, he said, he says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that they may, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So you're talking about keeping your conduct honorable so that like, when they, you know, speak out against you, they're the ones that look bad because what can they criticize? And um, when he talks about being subject to authority, um, he also says, um, for this is the will of God that by, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. And then a little later, for what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if... When you do good and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing on the side of God. He's, um, and then he compares, you know, Christian suffering to suffering of Christ. Well, Christ wasn't silent. Like, he, he says to be subject to every uh, human institution, but he also says not to suffer for doing evil or for covering up evil and, you know, just allowing it to happen. Um... So you can't just sit by silent either, right? Um, be subject to authority, but you can't sit by silent if it's evil. And um, that it's righteous to suffer in doing good. Well, doing good requires action, standing up, speaking out. And, um, yeah, so so um, just this idea of, yes, be subject to every human institution, but also don't suffer in covering up evil. Um, it's, it is righteous to suffer in doing good. Peter isn't telling us to suffer in silence under oppressive authorities. This is suffering for living out your faith, despite it being frowned upon or mocked or reviled or made illegal, right? Jesus didn't shut up. He spoke and he called out and he healed on the Sabbath and um, they, they killed him for it. So uh, I'm not, you know, hopefully you don't go out there and have to do that. And you're not necessarily going to um, you know, go out there on a national scale and stand up and make, you know, initiate change. But this importance of having a high moral character, doing good and being above reproach so that when you do need to speak out against something that is wrong or um, do something, you know, against 
someone telling you to do something that is wrong, um, that when you do that, they have nothing to come back at you with. They're, you, you're above reproach. They can't, um, you know, um, say anything bad about you that your example shows that, no, I am doing good. This is of the Lord. And so while you may not make some change on, you know, a national level, but you could make a change, um, change a cycle of mistreatment in a family unit. You could, um, you know, be standing up against bad policies and practices in a workplace um, and protecting those who can't speak up for themselves. So um, it's important to be living of high moral character and um, taking after Rosa in that way. Um, so that's all I got for you today. Um, thanks. See you later, Hillside.